is talking on behalf of Bristol Together, one of Bristol's largest social enterprises, but also engaged in financial innovation and replicating their models. So it's a really interesting story to tell. I'm very grateful that you can step in on behalf of the parents. So please do welcome into the stage. <laughs> Thanks very much, Daniel. So, yes, uh, just to reiterate that uh, the founder, the visionary, is not me. I'd love to take the credit, but it's a guy called, wonderful guy called Paul Harrow, who couldn't be here. But he's asked me to talk about Bristol Together. So I'm here as a, a non-executive director of Bristol Together. Um, Bristol Together is about building homes and rebuilding lives. And I'll explain a little bit about what that means. In terms of the building homes part, maybe the enterprise part, the social enterprise, um, what we're talking about here is, a, is property development. We're talking about buying properties on the open market. We're talking about partnering with the city council with their empty homes. And we're then saying, we're going to do those properties up and we're going to sell them. And it's as simple as that. And what are the things that are going to make that succeed? Well, you need to do three things, really. You need to deliver it on time. You need to deliver it on budget. And you need to deliver the right quality. Very simple. What's the twist? What's the social impact? What are, what are we doing differently? Well, actually, the twist is that we're working with ex-offenders, ex-offenders often with very long sentences, uh, with histories that are, uh, by some standards, very difficult to change. Uh, but actually, Bristol Together believes in those individuals and thinks, actually, there is a second chance. And a bit like Richard was saying, the mayor, there's a point in investing in the long term in these individuals. So, that's kind of the, the model, and the question is, what's Bristol Together done? Well, if I just focus on some of the, uh, the impact that it's made first, and then I'll talk about some of the mechanics, and then really talk about how that might emerge as a model that can be replicated nationally. So in terms of the clients that we've helped, um, it's about 45 clients within the last, uh, let's say, three or so years. So that's, that's 45 people who are coming out of prison, who normally would revolve quite quickly round the door and back into prison because of uh, the, the nature of the way the system, if you like, is set up. Um, so, what is the intervention that's breaking that revolving door policy uh, with prisons? Well, these people, they're mainly 20 to 29, uh, and in terms of the age, age group, that just so happens to be the group we've helped. They have, as I said, re uh, received substantial sentences, and they are not an easy group to deal with. They have a high risk of re-offending. That's clear. Does that make property development easier or more difficult? It makes it more difficult, as you would expect. 15% of those people have been either absent or they've been dismissed. There's no going around that. People haven't turned up, people haven't performed. 14% uh, uh, has been the track record of sickness and authorised unauthorised absence. Uh, that's 10 times the national average. So you're talking about engaging with the labour force that yes we believe in, yes we want to give a second chance to. However, when you're trying to apply that to a commercial model where you've got to get things done quickly in the budget and to a certain quality, it creates additional challenges. Does that mean we should give up and go home? No, we keep going and we try our best. Why do we keep going and we try to and try our best? Because the results are telling us at the moment that the reoffending rates of those individuals who've helped, the 45 or so, are very, very low. The reoffending rates of the 45 plants we've looked at today are at 5%. About, so that's two, two people. Now there are different statistics as to you know, what is the national reoffending rate, you know, what is it normally that uh, happens to people. But if you, if you compare that to, let's say, an average reoffending rate of 50%, the estimate is that saving to the state of the intervention through Bristol together, for those 45 people, we calculated around about a million, a million pounds. So that's saving to the state in terms of time in prison, that's saving to the state in terms of uh, housing benefit, saving to the state in terms of job seekers allowance. So there is a payback to society as well as the payback to the individual and just this concept of believing ind individuals can have a second chance. <laughs> How does the investment model work? Well, Bristol together raised about 1.6 million of investment. So it's investment in the true sense, it is repayable, has a coupon, it can, it, it needs to be repaid. Um, given that you've got an underlying property development model, which is challenging because you've got a, a client group that create their own uh, specific challenges, can we do that? 
well, it's not easy, but we're trying, we're having a very good go at that, and actually we think we can. Um, we're three years in, and um, the, the model that we've, uh, in a sense, proven, or in the process of proving with Bristol Together, is now being replicated elsewhere in the country. So not only is there a Bristol together, there's also Midlands together, there's also Glasgow together. And they each have slightly different operating models, they're sensitive to the local region and the local economy and the way that the uh, local infrastructure is set up, but roughly speaking it's the, same, it's the same model. I think some of the vision that Paul and others have got is to, can this be expanded, can, it, can this be extended? And we think the answer is yes. One of the most interesting developments recently with Glasgow together has been actually, could we produce timber frame housing <coughs> at scale? Okay, maybe we can. If we can, where can we produce it? But actually, if it's a production line, why, why not start that production line within the prison walls? And then having started that production line within the prison walls, when people come out, continue that production line outside the prison, prison walls, produce homes, rebuild lives, build skills, build employability. And in the meantime, raise investment, repay the investment because you're managing on a commercial basis, you've got a board of directors who are looking at things very commercially, but at the same time believe in the client group. So, that's Bristol Together and the wider Together group. Um, hopefully I've painted out that it's worth doing, but it's not easy. I don't think social enterprise is easy, but I also think that's not a reason not to do it. So, thanks for your time. Next up, I wanted to introduce someone who's been uh, mentioned once already um, in some of the presentations. I the sound of the earlier today. Um, but this is someone who's, who's really taken a business model and, and grown it really rapidly, but also really like into parts of the city, which I've always seen it. So um, I'm really pleased to introduce Steve Clover and everybody to the stage. stuck a bit because I uh, did write some notes quickly and I'm going to lose them on the way here so I've rewritten them on here in a bit of a chaotic kind of way which kind of sums up really the way that uh, such an enterprise works sometimes. It's completely <laughs> chaotic and uh, a bit haphazard. So um, who we are and what we do, we, I am the founder and the CEO of The Seven Project and The Seven Project um, uses the production of uh, food as a vehicle to provide education, training and employment for socially excluded people. Um, we, I, I, eight years ago I went to university at the age of 42 years old. Up until that period I'd been a builder in Spain, in Ireland, in England. And I decided to retrain and get a degree in addictions counselling. And because uh, I was very passionate about helping people and I, I wanted to find out why it was some people could stop using substances and some people couldn't. And uh, I, so I went and worked in residential treatment once I got a degree and uh, what was happening was that people were uh, really keen about getting clean and um, really sort of, you know, positive about the, the experience of getting clean and then when they left there was nothing for them to do so quite often they would uh, relapse, 80% of people relapse as soon as they leave treatment or within three months of leaving treatment statistically. And uh, there was nothing, for, and the reason for that was because they were going back to the originating environment and there was nothing for them to do uh, that was any different to what they were doing before. So while a uh, treatment episode is very healthy and it's a good thing to have three months away from substances and influences, uh, the, the longitudinal outcome is that it's, it's pointless if there's nothing for them to do when they leave. So I found out why it was that there was nothing for them to do when they leave, and it's because there's no funding. So uh, the organisation I was working with said let's set something up which would have been the seven hundred and they said there was no money and um, I, so I set it up myself with two and a half thousand pounds from Unlimited and at that point I didn't know anything about growing food, I didn't know Bristol, I didn't know anybody in Bristol, I didn't know the catering trade, I didn't know anything about restaurants apart from which ones not to go in, which ones to go in, which ones I could afford to go in as a student as well, which were very few. Um, and uh, so it was a bit of a challenge, you know, and uh, I also taking 12 people who are uh, very early in recovery and accommodating them in, in, in some housing that we've managed to um, arrange and supporting those 12 people through that process while teaching them how to grow food and, you know, learning how to grow food was so very difficult. So in the first year we turned over £30,000, which was massive. 
and we started with two and a half thousand pounds. This this week, we turned over over three thousand pounds. So we've grown uh, considerably since we started. Uh, so currently, okay. So that's that bit. Okay. So and that bit. Okay. So currently, what we're doing is we're farming on two different sites. One is right next to the Centre Road Station, which uh, I did send a photograph in, but you guys can Oh, there it is. So this is was the most productive urban farm in the country uh, in the last year. We think, uh, and I can say quite a few of them in the last one, and I can say that we are. And uh, last year, 25 tons of salads. That's uh, about 120 restaurants <coughs> in the Bristol area delivered by us. Also delivered to uh, the rest of the southwest through uh, secondary wholesalers that we also supply to. And uh, currently, we're selling four times as much this March that we saw last March, but we've also, with the help of our friends at Residents and other organisations, School Social Entrepreneurs, Unlimited, and um, like that, um, we've managed to uh, start our second site, which has got five times as many polytunnels as that, and has uh, uh, the ability to drive tractors through those polytunnels, which means that we can actually produce a lot more than we were producing. Uh, it was a very intensive process as it is at the moment. Uh, so, the overview of social enterprise for me is that, that strong business generates social outcomes or can generate social outcomes. And uh, weak business doesn't generate anything but stress, really. And uh, in the first year, I demonstrated that to myself. And in the second, so, in the first year, we did accommodation and therapy support and everything that we could possibly do. In the second year, we decided we wouldn't do accommodation because I was being called in at 3 o'clock in the morning to do drug tests and alcohol tests and not getting paid either by anybody. And um, so, the second year, we did um, volunteers, and we just had loads and loads of volunteers. And in the third year, we said we're not going to have any more volunteers. Well, we'll have volunteers, but not just on an ad hoc basis. We'll arrange volunteers to come in. But what we will do is we will uh, have apprentices. So, in the, second, in the third year, I think we have better quality social outcomes than we, than we had any of the other years, but even though the quality, quantity was slightly less. Okay. And uh, so this this year that's just gone by, uh, we, we capitalised on that and, um, and um, yeah, and we're just we're, we're, we're doing apprentices again. This year we're, we're, we've managed to get to the point where we can employ a volunteer coordinator, so it's apprentices and uh, and volunteers. Okay, so uh, a quick thing about, you know, the isolation of the social entrepreneur. I mean, I'm not from Bristol. When I started, I see a nice person walking down the street and invite them to be a uh, director. These days, things are a little bit different to start, but the networks that we, we have, uh, <laughs> the networks that we've benefited from is uh, social enterprise works, uh, residents, as I said earlier, school social entrepreneurs. SEUK are uh, promised to help me with my political lobbying, which has been a little messy in the last few months, so we might know a little bit about that. And in the last year, we were voted one of the 500 most radical organisations in the UK. And um, just one quick last thing about innovation. So, two ways we to make rights. One is our, one of our satellite growers is Lake Hill Prison. Another satellite grower is going to be Bristol Prison. And uh, what we do is we consolidate all the projects that they grow and sell it to our customers uh, on behalf of the prisons and to others. And the other way that we innovate is that volunteers become apprentices and apprentices become satellite growers. And then, so we're not just building a platform for people to get up onto and say, I'm a volunteer now and then I'm an apprentice. We want people to actually grow food for a living to feed into our system so that people like you get more good quality food, people like them get more uh, empowerment. That's about it.
video, so you don't have to listen to me blabbering uh, off for five minutes. Uh, Campus Skate Park is a not-for-profit social enterprise. We use skate park-based activities to engage communities and support young people in and around Bristol. Our new and ambitious project is the Campus Pool. Our vision is to regenerate Bishopsworth Swimming Pool from a disused derelict building into a thriving youth and community hub, serving both the local and wider community. This will be done through the construction of a world-class indoor concrete skate park, giving the building both focus and a new identity. The skate park will be coupled with high quality community spaces, housing a cafe, meeting room and office space. The building will be staffed by trained youth workers on hand to offer support and guidance to young people. The cost of complete regeneration of the swimming pool is £300,000. With a combination of some of our own money, a business loan and a small amount of grant funding, this dream is getting very close to realisation. But we need your help. We need to raise another £40,000. Once we reach this target, we can book in contractors and announce an opening date. We're asking for you to help by donating to our local giving site. If you donate, local giving will match your donation pound for pound up to £10. So please donate. We understand that £40,000 sounds like a lot of money, but rest assured we'll be doing everything that we can to bridge this gap. So whilst you're out there skating and donating, we'll be working hard to make this concrete dream a concrete reality. <laughs> because we knew that as a business we wanted to still be able to draw down funding and be able to apply for pots of money that were available to charities or community companies. Um, so first off, I'm just going to, I haven't made any notes, so let me just say that if you want to ask any questions, if I'm leaving anything out, come and find me at the back and, uh, and ask me something, I'll be able to answer it a lot better than I will be able to talk about it now. Um, we started uh, Campus Skate Parks in 2011 um, in an old site in Markby Road in Bedminster, at the old college site. Uh, the reason we started that was because myself as a youth worker, my business partner as a social worker, we kind of foresaw the change in what in how youth work was going to be delivered and the fact that funding was drying up. We realised that if we wanted financial stability, we would have to make that, that stability ourselves. So using skateboarding as the medium to engage young people and also the way to generate revenue. So we provide a, a space where people can skate, but we charge them to come and use that facility. Uh, that then goes into, our, well, that generates revenue to then provide that space for young people to come and enjoy it. That makes sense to you. Um, in, just quickly, uh, yeah, so it's all about being sustainable. We um, are currently uh, only reliant on 12% of our revenue from funding. So we are 88% sustainable as an organization. Uh, with the expansion into the swimming pool, um, our business model says it will be 100% sustainable. So we will not rely on any funding from local government or any other funders. But we still want funding, obviously, and um, and any funding that comes our way, we'll use, to, we'll put to good use, and that will go into developing more targeted youth work. Um, in 2013, we were shortlisted for Social Enterprise of the Year for National Business Awards. I'll just throw that in there quickly. Um, <laughs> we didn't win, obviously. Otherwise, I'd you that we won that. But shortlisted is great, you know, as a small organisation. So, moving on uh, to Bishopsworth Pool, that is, uh, well, actually, let me take back to um, Winterbourne site, which is an uh, old youth centre that we took over through the Community Asset Transfer Scheme, um, and that's under South Gloss. We um, heard about the property being available, we put an expression of interest in, we were an organisation that had one year of accounts and um, 
through the business model and we were awarded that site. So we've now taken over a building from the council that was open three days a week for an average of four hours a day. Uh, we are now open seven days a week for an average of eight hours a day. That isn't necessarily because we want to provide youth work for all that time. It's actually because as a business we make more money when we're open. So it makes business sense to be open more. We can charge more people to come in and use our facility. We also have a cafe and we have a skate shop all linked into that. And uh, the same thinking goes with opening another site. So once we've got two sites, <coughs> we'll be able to accommodate well, hopefully more than twice the amount of people. We'll have two cafes running, we'll have two skate shops, and also we are online. Um, youth work. Youth work is at the centre of what we do, and uh, as a youth worker, I feel quite passionate about providing space for young people to feel welcome and uh, be able to grow and succeed in life. What we are doing, we feel quite successfully, is we are rebranding youth work. We don't call our centres youth clubs, we call it a skate park. We have a brand that young people buy into and want to attend. Basically makes it way easier to engage anyone because they want to be there. We're not just a centre that is open on their doorstep. Um, quickly, currently we have 4,000 members. We average about 250 different people attending our site in Winterbourne every week. Um, and we're hoping to expand this into uh, Bristol. One of the issues that we face, quickly after a conversation I just had earlier, is um, as a social enterprise it's quite hard to know where you can, uh, or where business ends and social enterprise begins, let's put it that way. So we, we want to draw down funding to provide this facility in South Bristol, and yet a lot of funders and possibly local councillors or government believe almost that we are too motivated and that it will just happen automatically without anyone giving us the funds to provide that space. And that's an issue that we face quite heavily, certainly with Bishop's with Pool. So, just to break it down, we have Bishop's Pool, the project's going to cost £300,000. We haven't received any bit of funding to go towards that project. We have some, we've got a uh, pot of money given to us from uh, big issue invest a loan of eighty thousand. We've got we're investing a little over twenty thousand of our own money, and that video actually amazingly managed to get us twelve thousand pounds, and that is just from local people donating anywhere between ten ten pounds and I think our biggest um, was five thousand, which is great. Um, so I think I'm going to go now. But please, if you have any questions, come and contact me, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. speakers up on the top table for a moment. We've got a bit of time for questions. I think I'm going to start with the first one. So thank you guys for some really inspiring presentation but also a bit of insight into how your business model solved. The original instrument somebody touched on there is part of what we'd like to see in the event, which is What's the change that you would like to see in the city beyond just the reach of your business? And who do you want to involve in some of that conversation? That's a good question. I mean, all of us need things that have been pointed out by other speakers. You know, we all need, we all need uh, some financial help, we all need uh, other types of support. You know, being a social entrepreneur can be a very isolating experience. And uh, what else we need? We need, we need um, active examples that are ongoing that other people can visit and be inspired by. I mean, I don't know anything about what this guy does, he doesn't really probably know much about what I do. But by you doing what you're doing, you brought us together and we're having a chat and sharing information. And through those things, what else would you like to see change? How would you like to further influence the food industry? Um, I'd like to see a lot more people growing food, and we put on our website an offer of thirty-seven thousand pounds to be spent in the next three months on people who who want to grow food for us to sell for them. So that's what I'd like to see that done really quite soon. Thank you. Um, I think um, yeah, I guess basically within youth work uh, in Bristol, I think I'd like to see people doing. And not asking, I know that's a bit of a weird thing, but I think so many people just ask all the time, or ask for change, 
and we'll ask for someone else to do something. And actually, as a social entrepreneur, you're doing, you're, you know, we're all doing something, and we've taken that plunge and we said we're just going to do it. You know, certainly with us in the pool, we've we were asking actually, and we're still asking, so we're one, but we, we actually made that decision just to go ahead and do it. You know, whether we have all the funds or not, we're going to go for it. So I think that's how you how you change things, and that's what I'd like to see from Bristol. And also, actually, people supporting those doers, I think that would be quite great, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, often like people do things and they carry on, and everyone's like, oh, that's great, you know, big yeah, pat on the back, so you know, a big pat on the back, and it's always, you know, a great project and a great this, but no, there's not any other real support after that. So, um, Having said that, the Bristol Council were great in, the, in us getting uh, the building in Bishop's So, yeah, from my, from my perspective, I think, and you know, I'd like to talk from the Bristol Together perspective as well. Um, you know, this is for me first and foremost about people, um, and there are a few people. I know there's a lot in Bristol, but there's still it's only a tiny proportion of people who are really sort of engaging and getting involved. And actually, to make a difference with the sort of client group Bristol Together is engaging with does take time, it takes effort, it takes one-to-one -one support, it takes mentoring, it takes belief, and it takes actually, I won't go soft on you, a bit of love. Um, so I think widening the message, uh, maybe bringing the message in early via education, primary school education, secondary school education, and then the wider point around, you know, the means to the end is actually the property development model. And how, how can that uh, grow in Bristol and other regions? Well, actually, I think, yeah, we do need to take a bit of a risk. We do need to take a long-term view. We do need to connect the public, private, and social sectors much better. Um, and then we can start building homes in prisons and building homes that uh, last and, and house people at affordable rents and start to you know, reduce some of these project problems which actually I don't think are intractable as long as everyone points in the right direction. Thank you. I'd like to go over the School for Social Entrepreneurs. Uh, it's an odd question for me as a social entrepreneur, support our social entrepreneurs, but Seeing all three of you are working in a way with a, with client groups which are kind of within the public sector being supported and maybe being less and less supported, and you're picking stuff up, you know, on addiction or on youth or on you know, prisoners and, and ex-offenders. What do you feel in this new changing landscape does the st state still need to do, whether at local level or at national level? What what does it need to do to support this kind of work we're doing here? My perspective, you know, we're talking about the breakup of the probation service, you know, the prison service being um, privatised, and um, group G4S going into uh, providing prison services. Um, that, that is going to happen with drug and alcohol work, you know. Um, so, uh, did you notice that none of us talked about picking up contracts, whereas the last lot of people did talk about picking up contracts? Um, I think that we, we probably, I mean, from my personal perspective, is that I've got a personal history of substance misuse myself. And so I understand what it, how it works and, and, and what is needed to be put into place in order for it to happen. And I'm sure that the other guys, you may even know them on our personal experience of the uh, behaviour that the client group might exhibit, I'm sure that the passion that they feel means that they're bringing something to the table that mainstream uh, procured, procured commission services find very, very difficult to do. I mean, we, we are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs innovate and move forward and they change and that doesn't work, this doesn't, you know what I mean? It, procured systems can't do that. Okay. Um, I just want to ask one more question, but I'll, I'll make way for this first. Sorry. No, no, it's... Um, I, I was really interested in the point you were making about um, the fact that people rely on the fact that if you, they don't invest it, then you might do it anyway. And I think there's a lot of, that really rings true for me. You know, people in this sector tend to grind themselves to the ground and, and invest themselves to bankruptcy because they're so passionate about what they're trying to do. Um, speaking from very personal experience there. Um, and I, I'm just interested in, is there a way that we as a, as a sector can be looking better at how we measure those, those, that sort of value that is being put in, the value in kind, the hundreds of thousands of pounds of value in kind that is being put in every day in this city in that sort of space. We tend to give uh, sponsors or corporate um, 
you know, grant givers huge amounts of credence and, and, and slightly bow down to them if they give £100,000 to a project. But actually, many of the social entrepreneurs have given way more than that in either money or, or, t or time. What, what would your advice be about how we as a sector can really start demonstrating our value in a way that is accepted by um, a broader range of people? Um, I don't know if I have any advice on that. I think for us, it's a, this is one of the issues that we have. You know, in, t in terms of taking on, on the pool side, it's a, it's a bit of a game, isn't it, when you're negotiating a lease or negotiating, trying to get some, um, some funding, and, and there's two ways to do it. So either you say, look, this isn't going to happen without your contribution, uh, which is a nice way to play it. Um, uh, but then a lot, of, a lot of funders or the authorities say, well, if it's not going to happen, how much will this contribution actually make, you know, to the grand scheme of things? And then, and then you turn around and you say, okay, well, this is happening. How much can you give or you ask for the same amount? And then they go, well, it's happening anyway, so we don't need to give anything. So I myself am asking for an answer in that one. I'd love to know how to do that, how to do that properly. What I can say is that, um, you know, this... What's been great in this process that we've been going through and still are going through is um, is the sense of community from the local local area-wise community, also the greater community and the skateboarding community, and people are rallying around. So yes, we're not necessarily getting support from financial support from <clears throat> from anyone or you know everyone we'd like to, but um, but local businesses are coming and saying you know we're going to give you pro bono work or in kind work or you know we'd like to donate these paying slabs to you. And that is that is amazing because that actually shows value of what you what you're trying to, to do and what you're going to provide. So uh, yeah, if any of you guys have asked me, that would be great. Well I think um, there, there is a place for measurement. I'm an accountant so I love it. Um, but I think it's only part of the, the answer. Um, so yes, number of hours volunteered, something like that is a, is a straight measure that you can look at is it going up, is it going down. Um, I think you know this conference is good for starting to communicate what it actually means to, to engage. You know, what are the organisations doing? What does it actually mean? What does social enterprise mean? Is it, is it the emperor's new clothes or is it something real? I think hope the more communication there is to say that actually it is something real um, and it is something good and then it starts to be celebrated and someone says I'm doing it, oh well, I'd like to do that as well. That will start to get the, the buzz going. You know, Bristol Green Capital is a great opportunity to do that. Um, can I just say something not about the screen capital, but about um, how we move forward with a few things? Uh, social bonds is a very good model that has been used in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. Uh, I'm very interested to hear what you were saying about, you know, that uh, uh, putting people in prison costs a lot of money, and then, you know, we was point putting them in prison to learn how to be better criminals so that they can go out and be put into a higher value prison, which costs more money. I mean, are we creating an underclass of people with substance misuse problems? With uh, recidivism pro problems, with criminal activity, uh, who who then we empower the local uh, economy or local authorities to to help them, but but they're not really helping. It's just maintaining this ongoing thing that generates an awful lot of money for a lot, a lot of people who are really good with these and know how to write procurement papers. Do you know, or, or are we going to innovate in these in these uh, circumstances and, and really, really make some? Some positive change and, and turn the people around. I mean, we 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 have got a <coughs> basic rule that we try to treat our people as assets, not commodities, and that is the big difference between us and a and a and a, and a, 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 a procured or, or a commissioned service. I mean, there's some great services out there. I'm not, I'm not complaining about all of them, but generally these people are treated as, as commodities, and, and I think that is where we're going wrong as a society. Thank you. Um, I promise Peter Hopper was done in this section in 1635, so I need to keep that. But I'm also really interested in maybe just, I want to go to think afterwards. I have this one thing that can achieve some of my life and you're interested in contacting. Or maybe take you to the next stage and get some of the discussion about what you would like to do.
the next section as a preamble really to our panel discussion. We're talking just for a few minutes about what some of the other social enterprise cities are doing in the UK. Just whilst we're talking about this, I'd be really grateful if we had a chair and panel members up on the top table ready for the debate. So, Bristol became a social enterprise city in 2013. I thought we were one of the first two, but Peter Hobbit reassured me we were the first, which is brilliant. Um, and it's been quite a lot of work to get this done because this isn't just about a piece of branding and saying how many social enterprises are here or what sort of things we might do, but actually putting a detailed plan in place for that. I'll talk about that in a little moment, but I'm really interested to use this network of cities and places so we can first learn about what other cities are doing, where we can use any of their techniques, how they engage partners, how they deliver benefits for our businesses, but also to how, how we can work together as cities to build more resilient economies and to also, um, I suppose, promote that network and work together to reach for opportunities which otherwise individually we wouldn't be able to. So I'll talk a little bit about Bristol and what we've done in a moment, but I just want to invite Peter up onto the stage to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done in this opportunity on Sunday. I have to just explain myself. I'm not desperate to leave Bristol. Yeah. In fact, I don't want to stay in my lovely city. I know it's been mentioned five times now. But I have to train to catch. Um, I got a very nice uh, Christmas gift, which was a ticket to go and see Grandmaster Flash. Remember Grandmaster Flash? Yeah. 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 That was the last night, and I decided to be in Bristol rather than see Grandmaster Flash. But tonight I've got a ticket for another gig um, from the same person, and I'm determined to go at least to one of the, the and enjoy one of the Christmas gifts I received. So that's the reason for, for dashing away. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about Sutherland or Plymouth or anything. I'm going to talk more broadly about some of the stuff that we are seeing emerging in the towns and cities that have won this accreditation as social enterprise cities or towns. So first of all, um, often it is just the beginning of the dialogue. You know, uh, local authority leaders, councillors, they love a badge. Um, whether it's beacon status or whether it's fair trade town, and often becoming a social enterprise city or town and getting that accreditation starts piquing their interest. What more can we do? And actually, so much of this isn't just about social enterprise. A great deal of this is about social value. How all of the different agencies, the commissioning teams, the procurement teams, the NHS, housing associations, universities, colleges, social enterprises, the voluntary and community sector, can come together and rethink and reimagine structures and processes which enable the creation of the best social outcomes within the constraints of the financial world in which we live. So um, I'm going to tell you briefly, first of all it starts with benchmarking. Uh, we did uh, some work with Durham, which isn't a social enterprise county, but they're, they're building up their uh, application as we speak. And first of all, it, it required a bit of benchmarking. First of all, they needed to understand how much are they already spending with large businesses, with SMEs, with social enterprise and charities, and how and what will make a difference in terms of shifting some of those uh, KPIs. And one of the things that we first discovered is that somewhere like Durham is really, really good at um, spending money with SMEs. Now that's great, right? You want to see money spent with local SMEs. But actually, when you break down SMEs, the medium bit of SMEs are uh, uh, businesses with uh, up to 250 employees. And actually, how much is going to micro businesses and the small bit of the SMEs? And what we realised was very good indeed. So actually, although the 74% the of all local authority spending is going to SMEs, when we actually break it down, Small businesses and micro-businesses and social enterprises weren't getting enough of the action. We had uh, the Economic um, Development Portfolio Holder in the Cabinet of, of Durham County Council chairing a social value task force with the local uh, FSB representative uh, and with others from the University and so on. The first thing to do was really understand what was happening. And so benchmarking was really critical. And then it was working with other peers, so you're not hitting them over the head and going, you're always getting it wrong but trying to create an enabling environment where they see how they fit into the world of social value and actually training them, taking them on a journey. So they're not just procurement officers or commissioners, so they're social value champions, they're superheroes with the ability to spend money in such profound ways that jobs can be created, uh, quality of life can, can be enhanced, and small business startups can really be given a leg up. So the first thing was to break down, down that kind of information and look at procurement and commissioning systems and look at things like funding support. What that has led to in places like Plymouth is a half a million pound uh, loan fund for social enterprises specifically. That can be then matched with other social investors. That means the cost of social investment can come down. The risk appetite can actually be enhanced. And actually money can flow into social enterprises that previously didn't get any. 
Sometimes, like in Durham, it is about um, leadership and it is about a portfolio holder taking on that role and that responsibility of actually driving it through. In Birmingham, Sir Albert Orr, who is the chief executive, the leader actually of Europe's largest local authority in terms of spend, personally chairs the social enterprise subgroup of the council because he's very, very interested in it. And he's also appointed uh, someone on the cabinet to scrutinise every single contract that the local authority lets to any provider to scrutinise that to see where the social value clauses, where the social and environmental opportunities exist. And it does require that level of dedication. In others, we've seen them take on the Building Health Partnerships Programme, which SEUK runs, which allows all sorts of different agencies to come together and think about shared outcomes and the health agenda. And actually, that, that pre procurement conversation, well before contracts are let, allows a constructive dialogue to take place before we get into that competitive uh, kind of environment. And that in itself has led to uh, you know, social enterprises winning contracts and commissions and opportunities that previously they weren't even on the radar of commissioning procurement. So there's a myriad of things that can be done. And what it does take is a bit of leadership. It takes uh, kind of participation and involvement from the private sector. PwC were also on social land task force in Durham. Uh, we've seen uh, engagement and support and mentoring uh, across uh, a whole raft of different social enterprises, big and small, from private sector leaders. But that being a two-way process where social enterprises can teach those businesses just as much as those businesses uh, are teaching the social enterprises. It takes a kind of a mindset. It takes uh, an ability to absorb risk and think about risk in different ways. But fundamentally, it is about the boring stuff of going through local authority policies, PQQs, uh, commissioning and procurement processes, <coughs> looking at funding opportunities, and pulling those apart and looking fundamentally, and from sometimes, you know, from a, a macro perspective, about what it means to create genuine social value and what the opportunities uh, exist. Most local authorities will account for a significant amount of spend in any local area. And actually making that spend go further, spending wisely, making sure that there are contract managers in place to ensure social outcomes are being met is all quite dry and dull, but it's absolutely uh, instrumental in driving this agenda forwards. These events, the rhetoric, the, the commitments from local MPs and civic leaders is not enough. And it's actually the social entrepreneurs that drive this agenda setting uh, process. But you have to do it in partnership. In other communities, like uh, in, in places like um, um, Birmingham, where I've also been recently, and in places like Cornwall, there is the opportunity to take social entrepreneurs and actually embed them in teams within local government or within the NHS. And I was a social enterprise ambassador a long time ago, and we did that role within government. And there is a, a much more important opportunity with devolution on the agenda for local social entrepreneurs to be given an opportunity to get into the heart of local authorities and other agencies, whatever they may be, and actually explore constructive change. What shifts need to take place on a micro level to actually open up the opportunities for small businesses and anyone who needs to create some social value locally? What's really, really impressive, and I'm going to finish right now, so you've got the, the panel questions to come, is really about bringing the cities together, bringing the towns and the areas and the regions together, so they can cross pollinate and share ideas. Because actually, if something's working in Durham, it's much easier than to sell it in Bristol. And if something's working really well in Bristol, it's much more likely to be taken on in Plymouth, or in Alston Moor, or in Cornwall, or in Gwynedd, or, or wherever it is it may be. So it's about sharing and learning, and it is about, unfortunately, getting down into the gritty detail, not just talking up the, the rhetoric around how important the social enterprise piece is within local economies. It requires that, that, deep, dive, that deep dive into what's going on, and it also requires a bit to benchmark and to monitor and track exactly what's happening in the local environment to see exactly what is working and what isn't. And we know that every community is different, and that's probably more evident in Bristol than anywhere else. Um, and we know that actually local uh, opportunities uh, exist where others might not in other parts of the country. So it's always going to be bespoke, it's always going to be unique, but take inspiration from others and do what some of the social entrepreneurs have already said, which is you know, build the local uh, networks and partnerships so the social entrepreneurs are coming together, they're asking for the same things in the local area, they're, they're giving uh, um, one voice with uh, a series of, of messages that everyone can to agree to rather than having you know, uh, a thousand social entrepreneurs all asking for different things. It does involve planning, it does involve influencing and lobbying, and it does involve a bit of hard work. But the prize is absolutely massive. <coughs> and small little shifts in local 
policy from NHS or statutory organisations can result in a huge amount of, of money, resource and opportunity flooding into the social enterprise sector. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Sunderland and Plymouth, we put it out into the network of cities to say, look, we're really interested in hearing how you work with partners to get things done, and actually what their own benefits and results did. These cities came back and wanted to capture that and share that. And then these videos, they were really good. They were about eight minutes each. Um, we didn't really want to chop them too much, so we've sent them out to all delegates prior to the event. And also, I'd encourage you to have a look at the message you would receive, have a look at the links to those videos, but also George Ferguson's talk um, at the network over because it gives a real insight into how some of those cities have done it. Um, I won't talk too much about Bristol, but you know, when we became one of the first social enterprise cities, I think we kind of did nudge for it to be the first actually, but Plymouth came in and we did a joint press release and it was really exciting. But I thought, look, there's lots of badges out there, there's lots of marketing exercises and I don't just want to be that, I want to actually take, I want to take this opportunity to build a program under that and use it as a provocation to say to civic partners, okay, how should we work together? You want to do something? What's it going to be? You know, what will you like to gain out of this? It's okay to talk in those kind of terms. What can you offer the process? And um, what are you going to be accountable for? Because we as a network who are resourced voluntarily over time, we're resourced very lightly, are going to say, yeah, we'll sort this for you. We'll create a social enterprise city. I think we would have been doing everyone a disservice to be honest. So instead, we had a plan which is lots of different organisations accountable for different kinds of things, anything ranging from education to finance, right through to resources. And some interesting things have come from that. Bristol University was really interested in the concept of a civic university and a civic entrepreneurship role. And that conversation built into something which joined in with UWE, and now they've got some money from Free Hefty and also Unlimited to do something called Good Lab, which is a really exciting project bridging the gap between social innovation and universities and looking at blueprints on those joint projects and showcasing the stuff that was worked already. Conversation with housing associations around what they would really like to achieve in terms of working with social business. It was very interesting. And they said, look, we want to fit more of these organisations in our supply chain. And that took a very long time to sort of nudge that forward from a principal commitment. But that's now become um, a project called By Local, By Social, which is supporting some of those organisations, building a market for buyers who want to procure from local businesses and actually delivering contracts which specify social criteria. And also, social investment featured in that, and that's been a really interesting journey in Bristol. I'm sure you've had a bit about from residents, but also Great Bristol Regional Capital are part of that. With another fund nearby, which is St John's Bath, and all of that sort of conversation and the work to, to build um, the right kind of wraparound support as part of that. And that is a journey that started some of those early conversations, not as a direct consequence of what we've done, but just through what partners wanted to see in a city and working together. That's about all I want to say because I'm conscious we've talked for a while and I really want to make way for um, the main event in this part of the, this programme, which is the panel. So I'm really pleased to introduce um, Gary Top as our chair for the panel. And Gary has had an interesting, uh, interesting career building a few social enterprises and has now taken on a really interesting challenge to take the network, which is just a really powerful partnership. Sorry, you've gone off the mic. You've gone off the mic, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't as loud as Peter, I thought I'd be able to get away with it. He was much better than his voice travel. But um, Gary is now taking the, the Green Capital Partnership, which I had a connection with in a former life, and turning that into a social business. And as part of that, working at the strategic change piece, which we are all one part of. So without further ado, I want to hand over to Gary and the panel to introduce yourselves. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Daniel. It's ten to five. How long have we got? <laughs> We were already running for a minute, so we're going to have a, a very quick but um, uh, dynamic conversation to end. Um, I've been asked to remind you that there are some drinks and nibbles. <laughs> That's enough for me to say. Um, before I introduce the panel, the first question that we're going to address is actually how all of this fantastic stuff we've heard about over the last few hours adds up to um, what the people in this particular building like to call disruptive technology. Yeah? How do we envisage a radical future for this city, better for people and planet, yeah? out of the conversations that we've had this afternoon? And so that was my way of warning my panel guests um, of the first thing that I would ask them to talk about. 
um, uh, as they introduce themselves. So, so yeah, look, it's great for me to be here. I'm just helping Liz and the directors of the Bristol Green Capital CIC go through their transition and to become the legacy organisation um, for the European Green Capital leader. Um, and um, that's some journey for this organisation and an exciting one for this city to go on. It is a piece of disruptive technology that we're trying to design in. Um, Andy, a minute on yourself and a response to the disruptive technology question. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm Andy Wilson from the University of Bristol. I'm, uh, I work on climate change in cities, low carbon cities in particular, uh, and a lot on the kind of economics and financing and the business models of how to deliver a low carbon economy. And this is a huge deal at the national scale. The, the estimates are we have spent £35 billion pounds retrofitting just houses, probably the same again for commercial buildings. So there's an enormous amount of money and the need to kind of deploy that money in a, a, a socially beneficial way, ideally. But most of the contracts that are coming out are not like that. They're not involving social enterprise to any great degree. Uh, and there are costs and you know, enormous lost opportunities that come along with that. So I work on the kind of ways in which a big city like Bristol could deliver uh, all of that. And it's probably going to run into hundreds of millions of pounds just to do the housing sector. So the scale of the opportunity for social enterprises should be pretty significant. Um, in terms of disruptive technologies, I, I think that um, you know, there are enormous opportunities not to do with technology so much as to do with disruptive business models and you know, the, the upsurge of uh, the fantastic stuff that has been talked about this afternoon is a clear example of how to do that. But when, it, when you apply that to retrofit, you think, well, there's a huge scaling up challenge to be done and they're kind of accelerating aspects of that too. You know, if um, cities like Birmingham have had, I was talking to someone in the break about this, a hundred million pound fund just as a pilot project and they expected if that pilot had worked and it hadn't, I, I would argue partly because it was delivered by big business rather than by social enterprise, then they were expecting to scale that up opportunity up to 1.3 billion for one city. It's a huge, huge opportunity. And I think there's a, a kind of matchmaking exercise to be done. We need an awful lot of capacity building in the social enterprise sector to begin to deliver business models which would work at scale. Uh, and I think <coughs> if the two could be married together, then there's an enormous opportunity to do more decarbonisation, but to deliver an awful lot of social benefit in the process rather than kind of cherry picking the easy options and running off with the money, which is um, what seems to be happening in some of the Social benefits and decarbonisation. Pick up on that for me. In your, in, 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 introduce yourself, of course, okay. but in, in your radical city future vision. Okay. So, I'm Lindsay, I'm from Real Ideas Organisation, and uh, what we do mostly is about education and learning. And I suppose, you know, the thing that I, I think I'd be really interested today that we've talked an awful lot about um, three brilliant examples of people doing social enterprise and very little about how we're creating the systemic opportunities for people to learn um, how to be social entrepreneurs um, and you know even more so you know how we're going to make sure that our children grow up um, not only understanding what social enterprise is but um, actually also having been liberated to continue to be what I think they probably are born as which is quite natural social entrepreneurs. So look, what we do is we primary schools, secondary schools, um, so I guess my disruptive technology bit is I think one of the things that's most exciting about social enterprise is that co-design with the people that you are working with is pretty much at the heart of most social enterprises, true social enterprises. Possibly that's a bit different if you're talking about some of the mutuals and spin-outs, but certainly startups, you know, everybody who is passionate about starting something up talks about working with the people um, who you know, uh, uh, are the sort of core of their social impact. Um, and that is profoundly disruptive. Um, and that's brilliant. Uh, and certainly when you talk to primary schools and secondary schools um, and they start off thinking, OK, it's going to be a bit like young enterprise. And, um, in fact, I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who said, we'd like to do a social enterprise project and what we think is young people should, um, should design an app. So I said, oh, OK. Because the problem with that is that actually we're starting in the wrong place. So what you've got to start with is what is it that young people want to change? They can tell you all of them. What is it in the world they want to change? Of course, she said. Oh, you mean we let them decide? Yeah, that's great. You know, let's start from that place and then they'll come up with the enterprise and make it happen. That is profoundly disruptive. Profoundly disruptive to schools, it's profoundly disruptive to society. I think we should have a lot more of it. Uh, 
Okay, so systemic change in co-creation. Stephen. Okay, well I'm Stephen Parsons and uh, uh, my role in all this is I am chair of the LEP, the Local Enterprise Partnership Social Enterprise Sector Group. Now, we were early in the piece. This, this sector group was created four years ago and uh, uh, Peter Holbrook was talking about One Voice. We were very early in the creation of One Voice. This is a, a group that meets uh, four times a year. Uh, there is no membership. Uh, it's, it's an open door uh, arrangement. Melissa Houston at the lab is the person who is the, uh, the gatekeeper on it. If anyone wants to, to come along, we meet in Bath with uh, with Sue in about uh, three weeks' time at St John's. Uh, come along. I mean, they're free form arrangements. So, you wanted to talk about um, uh, disruptive technology. Well, in a sense, we're we're not really about that. We're we're about being a voice. We're being about, about being a, a, a signpost. We're the people who, who created and funded the, the, the Bristol Bar Social Enterprise Network. So we are actually a sponsor, and we're very keen that social enterprise is given the, the maximum opportunity locally. Bristol in, and, and this region is a great place for social enterprise, and it just happens. It doesn't get a lot of help, but we actually want to provide help where, 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 it's, where it's needed. And, and so, for example, I mean, I can announce this afternoon, Great, region, great Western Regional Capital CIC is very close to being incorporated. Ed Rover there can talk to you about that. Uh, Richard Pendlebury can talk to you about that. This is going to be a fund of around £2 million initially. It will be funding to connect with opportunity in social enterprise. And it's a great piece of news, and, and we think it's going to pro provide a real difference to the region and, and, and to this enterprise. So, so we're into uh, endeavouring to bring order, not disruption, because you do need order as well, uh, maybe not the answer the chairman wanted, but I think it's, it's a combination and, and, and we're <coughs> to, to, to help make all this up. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you. I'm wondering how to follow up two million, uh, yeah. because that was a nice headline, so thanks, I nice suppose I'll touch. Um, my name's Nikki, I'm uh, with SOFA Project, I'm the newbie in the room, I've only been with SOFA for six months, so the world of social enterprise is quite new to me. My background for the charity, but not for social enterprise. So I'm pretty actually in awe of the experience that's been in the room, and it's really lovely to see that it's actually seen to be quite a family, which um, is really encouraging to me, I think, because I'm sort of developing and getting to know a bit more about what we're doing. Um, I think for me, the disruptiveness um, follows on a little bit from Lindsay, really. It's about embedding it in your organisation and encouraging your service users to have a full voice. <coughs> I suppose also I just made me think about the fact that today everyone's an expert in what they're doing, but I mean I haven't got I can break anyone from my organisation a lot. I could have brought one of the prisoners that we actually work with. Um, someone from the that would have been an amazing experience for him to see what actually is going on in the world around him. Who else is supporting him? What are the seven project doing? Other opportunities, maybe employment opportunities as well for when they get out of prison, because we actually work with certain prisoners. And then sort of twelve months is when they're getting released. So for me, it's about embedding it in the organisation and allowing everyone to have that voice. Like Lindsay said, let your service be said, don't tell you all, but you can more say. That's great. So that's the co-creation piece again. And I wonder, um, Jeff, whether you'd like to um, tell us how you think that might build a different vision of this city for the future. Well, before I do that, let me just introduce myself. Of course. I'm, uh, I, I, Jeff Gollop, and I'm deputy for the elected mayor. Uh, what that means is that probably more than anybody else in this city, I have a great interest in George's well-being and his good health. But also, I have been practicing carefully, um, advising small and large businesses. So when we were when we were mentioning SMEs earlier, my advice has been very much to the, the small end of the SME market and indeed to social enterprise. Uh, and I recognise the incredible value that small businesses and social enterprises and those who work in them give relative to what they cost and relative to much larger organisations' costs. So I have, a, I, have, I have a particular interest in that. Um, perhaps rather than answering your question, I, I, I'd just like to be a bit disruptive in terms of where today is and where today is gone. It's not my natural instinct to be disruptive, of course. Um, but, but I've sat here listening to what's been said, and, and I just think the power of, what, of, of what's going on actually doesn't surprise me because I know it's there. But I'm sat here thinking, how many of those people out there, all the way around Bristol, actually know 
the power of what's going on in the name of social enterprise. And do they know it's social enterprise? It's actually reinvesting in their local community. And one or two really key brands that happens and people do that. But I think we're missing a trick. The fact that of the various speakers today, we find some of them know each other and some of them don't. Um, all putting in phenomenal good practice and yet not necessarily knowing what each other, each other does and how they can affect them. And so I, I'm going to be putting the challenge out to, to everybody here of how do we get that message across? How do we get that message across with the real value that social enterprise adds to our community? And the things are changing. Um, there's no way that the local government or central government have the funds available to fund in the way that they used to. So actually, making social enterprise sustainable by finding other sources of finance is absolutely vital. But actually, the one thing social enterprise has got, in my view, is the most incredible goodwill from all those residents of our fantastic city and our fantastic communities. So therefore, come back to it's actually telling those people how good you are and how powerful your energy is to actually make sure that they know that there are ways they can either invest in or trade with or support your organisations. So that's the bit I think you've got to be disruptive in actually provoking others, including the local authority, to want to use your work here. Thank you very much. So the power of what's going on. The power of what's going on. So I'm sure we've got some observations out there. We've got some moving mics. David? Yeah. Um, you can use your loud voice, but the mic is coming. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, last Friday morning, there was an eclipse, and I came out of it to a social enterprise event at Bristol University, and I felt I'd come out to a different day. I've spent four years thinking of myself as a green entrepreneur, and I realized, and I was recognized, I saw the whole economy can be changed by social enterprises and become local. And I'm looking at technical innovation, for instance, putting solar energy, which is cheaper than other forms of energy, but it's actually the disruptive business model of putting it on people's roofs that changes it, and it comes into community ownership and cuts people's fuel bills by a third. One more example, uh, Bristol Outfit, Craig White and others have turned uh, straw bale panel buildings into a modular building system. It will deliver buildings at less cost than developers currently build for, super insulated, has a cost standard, but the social innovation, uh, and people will pay more for it, but the social innovation is when you build a co housing community with it, and the cost of ownership comes down by a third. And putting that together, the reference on this for me is Jeremy Rifkin's book, The Zero Marginal Cost Society, which is what's that all about. It's about technology change empowering social revolution. Uh, and, and the eclipse comes into it. It's called the Internet of Things, the Social uh, Commons, and the Eclipse of Capitalism. And I think in this case, the eclipse is the sun doesn't come back as capitalism, it comes back as local social economies. Thank you very much. So, um, we're talking a lot about change here, aren't we? And I'm trying to do, um, what, what we'll, we've done a lot this afternoon, very helpfully, is talk about some of those things, whether it's finance or business support or collaboration, that will help that happen. Yeah? So I just want to spend a few minutes and get some other observations. We are at the end of the Friday afternoon talking about a radical city future here. Yeah? Um, share some other thoughts, Richard, about um, your thinking about this new, new city future that we're trying to create. I mean, uh, Bristol's blessed with uh, you know, good employment here, but um, surely social enterprise must provide a really good option for jobs. Um, in my 24 years of doing this, I think that probably the most proud of is not buildings, is the jobs that have been created by the work I've done. And I think that we've got to try and think about business in that way. And I think some businesses can be not necessarily, you know, like the mayor's taking homeless people, but they could have social outcome. So take um, uh, it's Tom Shoes, you know, so every pair of shoes you borrow from Tom's, I think a, 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 a pair goes to someone in like, whatever they call it these days, to be the third or the developing world or the south or whatever we call it there. But 
I just really like the idea, and maybe Mr. Powell's got some thoughts about actually businesses that, that create jobs but have that sort of social impact. They, um, that I think, well, you know, create some jobs. Now, yeah, let's create some more jobs for the city. Maybe those who struggle to get an employment, uh, those who have not had a fantastic education, and maybe some of those young people and looking at the education educationists. You know, the people who don't fit in, I didn't particularly fit in, I expect the people who stood up today didn't fit in much either. Um, you know, we don't fit in school very well, and, you know, how can we kind of make that happen? Sorry, I've got all sorts of No, perfect, this is, this is, this is, so, uh, let's talk about not fitting in. Go on. Okay, I mean, uh, I think the... Power of not fitting in. Yeah, power of not fitting in. I mean, it's a sort of interesting one, isn't it? Because it's, is it, um, you know, my contention would be that our education system is just wrong. And the reason lots of bright, exciting, energetic, dynamic people don't fit in is not their fault. It's because actually education isn't creating the opportunities for them to be um, to, to realise who they are. And you know, there's some fantastic research, and people know probably Ken Robinson, you know, who does this amazing thing, which is you know, he's done experiments at five. You know, most children, 90% of children, display disruptive tendencies, the ability to think differently, creatively, you know, entrepreneurially. By the time they're 25, we've managed to educate that out of you know most of them. So we're left with two percent who are still demonstrating those behaviours, and you know that is just terrifying, frankly. Um, uh, and so it's I suppose the bit that I'm sort of interested in is how do we um, radically change the way that education works? And for me, actually, if you start to say, right, come on, every single school is really a social enterprise these days. They're all businesses. They're all academies and free schools or whatever. They're businesses. They have extraordinary resources. They do them. You know, they have kitchens that are not used for the large part of the year. They have sports facilities. They have arts facilities. They have all sorts of stuff. Well, come on then. Let's actually start to work properly with proper social businesses in those schools, which then can create real jobs. And that is happening. You know, we, uh, we are working with some schools where they are prepared to go on that journey and they are investing in it and they are doing it. So I think there are lots and lots of models, but I think the big challenge, which is the one that we all come back to, is how do you move that from being the great small examples into the way that everybody starts to work? And, you know, certainly with schools, got your own doctors, they're brave, they're out there, they're doing it. Our issue is how do we now move into the people who are not the early adopters? And I would say that's the general challenge for the social enterprise movement. I think we're doing pretty well with the early adopters, but how do we start to move them more mainstream? Um, and that is a really interesting challenge. Um, you know. So it's moving from that pioneering space, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we've got a room full of pioneers here, imagining this fantastic city future, reckoning the social enterprise is one of the tools that we have. Yeah. So there's a lot about there in people. You mentioned international. I mean, tell me about the work you've done internationally and this stuff, and perhaps put it back into slightly an environmental agenda for us as well. Uh, well, we work with cities around the world, climate change in various areas, and um, yeah, some of the challenges they face are very much around the informal sector, uh, informal settlements, and how to kind of formalise them up to a point and provide basic provisions for energy and water and sanitation. Right? And uh, you know, it's the same logic, the same kind of discourse of you know, how do we enable social change through economic development? You know, and the, the kind of argument of keeping many of the benefits within the city, uh, empowering people, and you know, social capital that can help development processes, you know, positive spillovers, if you like, for other aspects of city life is, is a really powerful one, and it appeals to city leaders. It appeals to you know, investors and, and the kind of sources of finance, but um, where it gets really interesting, I think, is when it's self-funded uh, and civic funding or community bonds or, or you know, a whole range of related financial initiatives, you know, they offer the opportunity for kind of growth to be driven from within rather than funded from without. And I think that the, the kind of um, excitement that comes with um, empowering cities and empowering communities to take control of their own future rather than being kind of dependent on other people to fund it is you know, one of the biggest benefits that we So it's a little bit of a self-help model, self, self -help model sorry. Mm -hmm. Jeff, what do you make of that? Well, you know, when we go back to Richard's initial comments, but if you look at Bristol as a whole, we have lots of very positive indicators in terms of economy, jobs, creation, and so on. In fact, the challenge we have is those inequalities within our communities. Um, I represent a, 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 a 
middle class affluent area within a very, very short distance of the area I represent. The life expectancy is 10 years less than it is within my ward. Um, if we take some of the other chambers of Bristol, there are, there are very significant issues. And um, it's not all about spending money. Um, government and local government have been spending money trying to redress those inequalities over decades. Uh, it would be horrendous to total on how much money has been spent, and yet those, the, the differentials are still there. And, and so I very much feel that the social enterprise model with, with, with actually accountability within social enterprise is the way to engage, is the way to ensure we have, we have problems in, in, in the areas that have high unemployment. It's a twofold problem. It's how do we get jobs into those areas, and how do we get the people who could work accepting that they can work and get them out of those areas to where the jobs are. So we, it has to be, we have to have jobs and people going in both directions. We have to make it possible. For too long, we've just been ignoring those problems and pretending that they'll go away because the average is, is actually better than any other country. Not exactly. We can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do so what we're beginning to try to get into this matter is a kind of future city that might look a little bit different to the one that we've got, but it's a great opportunity in municipal cities that have such strong assets already, many new people there, in place. So if you're doing a typical economic development strategy, then what you do is you say, where have we got strength in business and then we invest in it? So, okay, what are we good at and how do we amplify it? So, and if we do that, do we end up with a better future city for this world? Do we? Maybe. So I think within the, uh, the left our vision and, and uh, colleagues in the room who were part of the work we did, uh, we, we, uh, we came up with the, with the hub, the social enterprise hub concept, and in that hub there would be social enterprises, uh, there would be financial assistance, there would be business planning assistance, uh, there would be a wraparound for uh, individuals who were starting out on the road and, and who could be carried on. And, and we have a vision within the region of, of a river, that social device hubs that would have connectivity, that would able to be, be able to, to work with each other, uh, but would, would basically provide a stepping off point for social enterprise and for individuals who had the will and the skill and the ambition to, to, to enter into the world of social enterprise. And, and I think at a macro economic uh, level, this was actually going to make a difference within this region. And, and uh, Dan was part of that work, um, uh, and, uh, and Carl was, and, 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 and others. And, and you know, it's there. I mean, it's, uh, and, 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 and the left gets it. I mean, the left certainly understands uh, the, the importance of social value, um, the European funding that's going to come our way over the next year or so. Social value is critical. So the stars are all aligned with social enterprise in this region. Uh, 